Hello, Jill. Thank you so much for joining me on the Emil Varna podcast. Uh, as I said before, I'm so excited to kick off our conversation today around yoga, around body-based exercises. I mean, I'm really passionate about finding different ways to, to work with my clients. And I think one of the one of the staples I have in my own therapy that I work with with my clients on is some of the breathing exercises that you've taught and that I otherwise hadn't come across up until then. And so particularly the mm, ooh, and the ah breathing exercises, they were they, they were so they were so helpful to understand. And I love having so many different types of breathing exercises because some work with with some of my clients, others don't work. So I'm not uh, I'm not going to take too much time uh, banging on, but I will ask you um, if you could introduce yourself to our audience. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you have it. Great. Well, I'm delighted to be here. And um, Emil mentioned prior to us taping that he actually found me through YouTube, which boggles my mind because I, I don't think of myself as having a presence or a footprint on YouTube. We just happen to upload, you know, videos from time and again into our, our to tune up fitness account there. And um, that you came across the, probably this, the elements that we developed for an article on the vagus nerve and just to make it really accessible to people using, uh, offering tools that give you an immediate state shift in really safe and gentle and wonderful ways. So I'm really happy that you stumbled across that. And I'm proud of my team for tagging it correctly, like I, like I mentioned. But I am a well, Los Angeles-based educator. And I have a company called Tune Up Fitness. And we create educational products and um, services that work in a, many different communities. So um, originally, my first program that I created was called Yoga Tune Up. And Yoga Tune Up was a very disruptive format in the yoga space. I brought functional movement um, into yoga and really um, stepped out of sort of the current um, zeitgeist of vinyasa yoga or almost choreographed typed classes. And I, I, I wasn't seeing people um, I, I saw that, that students in class could really bypass um, certain joint movements or certain um, joint pressures um, and kind of hide their movement challenges cloaked in the vinyasa practice. And so I started to really slow things down, stop things completely and have people do self-massage practices, which we now call with my program called the role model. Um, we would do self-massage practices to heighten proprioception, um, to help people map their body, learn about their body parts, um, and then do functional exercises to um, help people to integrate uh, healthy joint kinematics, and then maybe we would go back and do a pose, or maybe we wouldn't. So I really brought sort of a disruptive kind of um, creative spin into the yoga classroom. And I don't know that we can even necessarily use the word yoga um, holistically anymore because it, it we really I really did open um, a can of worms there. Um, my <laughs> my current program that I'm super passionate about is probably how you found me. So I wrote a book called The Role Model, which covers my self-massage um, approach. But I've been working on another book for seven years called Body by Breath um, that we're in end stage edits on right now. And so that Vegas Nerve article or the videos that you came across are some of the elements that are embedded in, in Body by Breath, which really is a treasure chest of a treasure chest of tools that novel tools that help um, people to map and track parasympathetic states within themselves and also to build a reservoir of tools that um, they can use on demand, on command in any, any place within any context or community. That's there's so much there. Um, and I'd love, uh, you, you've touched on quite a few things in terms of the vagus nerve, proprioceptive awareness, how you, how you came into the yoga, uh, it kind of shifted things around in the yoga world and were really able to make something 
new, something different, something that really helps a person by slowing, slowing things down, working with those self massaging and self um, rolling exercises. I think you, you mentioned there and uh, some of which I've, I've tried on myself. I, I like to do my, anything that I try to teach, I like to make sure that I've done it myself. So I know what I'm teaching rather than just saying, Hey, I read this in the book, try this out and see what, what happens. Uh, and I'm actually really, really excited about the yoga uh, exercises around the vagus nerve. That's going to come in book form. So perhaps we can have you uh, later on uh, talk about that when it's, when it's up and running, but I'd love to get my hands on that book. If it's as helpful as the, the yoga the youtube videos that i came across that you know uh, you you're quite surprised yeah you know, i came i came across from from that me, uh, medium but let, let me ask you vagus nerve i mean I, i'm i'm having i'm having stephen poor just come on on the podcast uh soon to discuss the the vagus nerve and i think it's it's going to be really important because that's it's so it's so expansive, the applications of the vagus nerve, but for our listeners who don't really know the applications of the vagus nerve in terms of yoga, can you give them a rundown on how you came across the theory and how, how you've applied it? Oh, wow. So um, I'm swooning a little bit that I'm going to be on the same platform as Stephen. We've, we have <laughs> presented on, on same stages before, but um, Stephen is, I would consider him an academic mentor. I don't, he is not my teacher. I've never been in, in, I mean, I've only been in a lecture of his and I've listened to um, every single piece of material he's put out and read, you know, his books and scoured them routinely. So I'm, I'm just really impressed that uh, you're going to interview him. So excited for you uh, <laughs> because you. he is a magnanimous uh, uh, individual and um, I, 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 I can't help, but um want to get his work and his theory uh, out to all humans because I think it's really it's really helpful mm. it's a really helpful lens so in terms of the vagus nerve the nerve itself is the the 10th cranial nerve and it originates in your brain stem and it kind of hangs down uh, and burrows through the sides of your neck just like your well not everybody has um, I, iPhone uh, wires anymore. Everybody's wireless, but do you remember the wires you used to have? Yeah. Anyway, yep. the, so the the wires go down the left and the right side of the neck. Um, some of those um, fibers uh, tap into the sinoatrial node of the heart. So part of the job of the vagus nerve is to actually slow down our heart rate. Um, mm. Some of the other uh, some of the other neurons that are within the this massive vagus nerve, they embed themselves throughout the lungs. Um, they also pass down through the diaphragm, through a hiatus in the diaphragm, through a hole in the diaphragm, and they really invade the, the intestines. So our, our, vagus, our vagus is a surveillance nerve, and it's covering a lot of ground inside of our body from guts all the way um, up through our face, neck, and head. And each zone that the vagus innervates um, has unusual properties. And mm. in polyvagal theory, um, Dr. Porges emphasizes a, a lot that the, the vagus nerve through our evolution from being uh, amphibians to mammals had uh, went through a number of changes or was appropriated in different ways that may seem to be um, contradictory to the myth, the mythos of the, of the vagus, because most of us understand the vagus nerve as your rest and digest, your calm um, uh, nerve of homeostasis. It is your chief parasympathetic nerve and all of that's true, but also the vagus nerve, um, if it is hyper aroused, um, which it can become in states of shock or life threat, actually it will uh, hyperactivate and effectively that will actually turn us off. It'll put us into a freeze response or a pass out response mm. um, and immobilize us. So there's lots to talk about when you're talking about the, the vagus nerve, because um, there are, are different, uh, different things that it's governing or different ways that um, it is helping us to remain uh, calm, alert, and regulated. Mm. And that's, that's a really, I love the way that you were able to 
describe that because it's not just an academic sense. I, I remember the, the way that you use those words that it infiltrates, it goes through the hiatus of the, of the diaphragm and it invades your, your intestines. It well, really... I made it a little creepy, didn't I? I did use no, kind of Halloween I, language on that, but. I'm, I'm excited to read your book if it's, if it's anything like how you describe it um, over here, because I love the way you use words. Uh, if you're, if you're using words, uh, Porges, Porges's book is highly academic in terms of oh, yeah. the, yeah, and and I found that you have to read it back, apparently you have to read it from the back to the front, according to him in an in oh. interview that he that he conducted, and he was saying, and the first part of it is just going to be completely academic, but you've done a really good job at explaining what the vagus nerve is, uh, you've related it to, to that system that is that has evolved over you know, hundreds of millions of years i think it's over 350 million years ago that that this was you know it just, just around the time that trees were still not a thing and and it's a really interesting uh process that that we've come to to identify we've come to work with tell me how you were able to apply your learnings to the world that you work under and how, how the different strategies and, and exercises you teach people. Tell me about that. Um, so I've been practicing yoga since I was a kid, since I was about 11 years old. And I also started practicing self-massage around age 14. And those, um, those things, those uh, activities were extremely uh, regulating for me emotionally. I grew up um, with a lot of chaos in my in my mm. nuclear family, um, and I ended up uh, dealing with back to back eating disorders. So I was anorexic from age twelve to I don't know fifteen, and then I became um, bulimic from age um, sixteen to nineteen, and all all along that. Um, that time of, of being sick and dealing with mental illness, which was not being treated, just let's just say that I'm speaking to a therapist right now. Mm. Um, I was treating myself by um, doing mod modifying my body through the practices of yoga and um, fitness, which I now know, you know, those were those were those were the crutches that I was using to regulate myself, but they were also extremely destructive how I used um, exercise and yoga to regulate myself. And so that's a whole other story. That's a whole other, like, <laughs> uh, chron what does, what, what does a person who, you know, chronically stretches, how do you recover from being a chronic stretcher? Um, also someone just trying to self-soothe, right? Trying to lick the wounds all the time. So, um, but what I came to learn over the, over the course of um, addressing my bulimia head on was the following. So there was a time in college where my roommate was pre-med and I was in theater and dance and she would come to my Pilates classes with me. And my, my roommate would always complain about how sore her abs were from the Pilates classes. And I was like, my abs were never sore. I didn't know what she was talking about because I just had this giant black hole in my center. I had no feeling there. So I didn't feel, I didn't feel muscle tension, nor did I feel relief of, you know, of anything. And I, I thought that was very odd. Like I knew that that was wrong. It was wrong to not feel sore from Pilates. And so I mentioned this to a yoga teacher and the yoga teacher suggested that I lay belly down on a, a little bean bag that they use in the Iyengar um, yoga space. It's a little bean bag that they used for a head prop, but she suggested that I put this hamburger shaped bun bean bag on my abdomen and lay face down on it. Mm. And when I did, and to breathe, which I was a yoga student, I loved Shavasana, I loved all the breathing. So I did that. And by the way, I knew that um, not being able to, I'm sorry, my, my mother keeps texting me and I don't know how to turn off that. Thing. <laughs> I don't know how to turn it off. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a new computer that's tied to my phone. So um, I knew that there was a connection with the bulimia mm. and 
with uh, what that I wasn't feeling in my abdomen. It was mm. pretty clear to me. And so when I laid down on the bing bag, I began to feel everything. I felt enormous visceral pain. So it was incredibly uncomfortable. I mean, I, the, the kind of pain I felt in my gut was just incalculable. I've never felt anything like that. But along with that, the misery of the visceral pressure, I also started to feel my emotions and I started to click in to what I um, was running from and mm. also what, what I couldn't stop doing to myself, the harm I couldn't stop doing. And that began the, the process for me of going through my body to try to address uh, this obsessive compulsion with um, binging and purging um, and also avoiding my, my big feelings. Yeah, and yeah. so now I can just fast forward 30 something years later, which is where I'm at right now. Um, and the understanding of the, the innervation of the guts and the vagus and the, the wild ride of confused communication around ingestion, digestion, um, satiety, craving, and all of that, these are, these are urges and feelings and neurochemistry that's communicated from gut to brain via the vagus. So mm -hmm. uh, it's become, a, and there are many other reasons why the vagus is important to me, but um, it's become a really important um, analysis for me to understand the path of, the, of my own um, eating, eating disorder history. Um, when I started to learn about anatomy, go to cadaver labs, uh, research with just amazing anatomists, um, I started to understand more and more um, themes and connections. And then learning the psychological perspective uh, through somebody like Dr. Porges, things really came, came together for me. And so the tools that I, that I offer, I mean, I offer much gentler tools than the, the bean bag and a much, a much more scaled way of going into your insides. Um, that was pretty hardcore. I mean, that was 1990, probably. That was probably 1990 that I experienced wow. that. Um, but I've learned a lot since then about how to titrate that experience and to, and to host it for others. Um, and my focus in my work is not exclusively in the eating disorder community. There's very little, I put very little material out uh, towards that community. I'm not a psychotherapist, so I don't, I don't uh, purport to be, um, you know, to have any, any special services in that way. But I do know that for me, that was my, that was that dark night of the soul that allowed me to um, mm. really dig into the pathways that I have of, of respiration, fascia, uh, vagus nerve and, and all the things that, that come along with all of those huge things. Oh, certainly. And I, and I think the way that you describe it, we're, we're heading towards, um, another wave in psychotherapy treatment that that's been coming up. I think since, since the work of people like Dr. Porges and, uh, Peter Levine and other body-based therapists, which tend to go into, uh, I mean, Porges isn't a body-based therapist, but there are many, many body-based therapists who in, utilize the body in terms of getting, getting more acquainted with feeling because we're so, a lot of people in these days, in, in our day today, can try to cut off the feeling element as it seems like you have done it, without, without any, any thought to it. It's just that your body didn't seem to register the type of feeling until you were placed into a position where you, you uh, brought that about. And that for you was that beanbag and you, and then everything flooded in, in, in treatment, we, we had that cognitive revolution and then, you know, the behavioral revolutions and, you know, you had the psychodynamic revolutions earlier on. Uh, and now things are coming in terms of the more, body integrative approaches where you work out different strategies to, to utilize the body's wisdom. And that's why I think more and more therapists, uh, that this, this is why one of the reasons why I uh, have, have become acquainted to, with your work and with works of other, other professionals who may not be psychotherapists, but they are at the same time utilizing approaches that we learn from. So mm -hmm. 
you know, on behalf of, of all those who benefit from your, your approaches, that's, that's a huge thank you. And I think the, the type of work that you do sets the groundwork that we can learn from. I, I'd like to get into the practicalities of it, but, but before I do that, um, I'll give you some chance to respond to that. Yes, I am. Um, so, uh, so first of all, I'm so encouraged by that because I know that when I was trying to heal from my eating disorder, it was all CBT and it was all sort of mind over body. And it was like, just, just don't do that behavior. Um, mm. And it wasn't helping me to converse with the language of my body. And it wasn't helping to, you know, to, to rig up the dial tone from my guts to my, uh, my voice, and then my voice back to my guts. And really, that is the, the process of, uh, you know, delving into the interoceptive feedback of the body, which, you know, when you look at neural load, I mean, we have so much in our peripheral nervous system, there is so much our sensory system is communicating to us. And you know, maybe my amygdala is jumbo and pretty disorganized from, you know, certain um, traumas as a, as a child, but we really need help to communicate that bottom-up experience that's literally driving us crazy, mm. right? So, I mean, I really felt um, impaired by the urges I had. And these were body-based urges, right? Ta yeah. Like moving me in certain directions, moving me towards food or moving me um, towards the toilet or, or what have you. Mm. So it, to me, it's, it's really thrilling to um, present tools that uh, therapists, social workers, um, uh, you know, group therapists can use with clients um, to help people. What, what we say in my work is embody their body mm -hmm. and to really respect the feeling body, you know, my body, I, one of the things I have on my, I think it's on my Instagram page, my body thinks in feels. Um, and that the language of the body, it can only, it really only speaks um, when we can feel safely still, not still, when we can feel safe enough um, and quiet enough and calm enough to listen. I don't want to Im imply that mm. you need to be meditating to be able to listen. I'm actually writing a, a class right now about, it's a buffet of different meditation strategies because as polybagal theory explains that for many people, stillness is a huge threat. And when certain bodies go into stillness, that is when anxiety spikes. Their body tells them to get out because being still is associated um, with uh, being subdued or being trapped or, you know, or, or other, yeah. or other traumas that the, the body is still, is, is still remembering and hanging on to, uh, which is obviously that their, your mind is like, well, no, I don't want this to happen, but too bad the body's having this experience. And so we have to um, continue, continue to just be better listeners and to work that dance through. Um, yeah. Two, two things there um the body thinks in the feels mm -hmm. i love that i love that i'm i'm I think i'm gonna i'm gonna take that i'm gonna i'm gonna attribute you attribute you to it and make sure that I, I teach as many people as i can that that concept because it's so true um and and second thing is the the stillness i've had so many people who have significant chronic trauma that have happened over over their life in, in all sorts of ways and being still or trying if someone's like oh, just let's do some meditation or some mindfulness that in itself initiates a, a traumatic re-experiencing response and that's really tough because they sit down and then they they get to a sense of safety of calm and then their body has a jolts in a particular way or kind of moves and it's about if, if you just try to understand that from a cognitive point of view, it's, it's little, little solace in any, that there's little comfort in any of that. So, so for, for years, I've been trying to say, okay, well, what's, what's going on there? What does your body feel like it needs to do? In what way are you moving your body? If we were to slow that down or if we were to exaggerate it in some way, say your body's kind of like um, jolting to that way. If we can, uh, 
exaggerate it a little bit and slow it down and move it, what happens then? Um, this this buries uh, this carries on from the work of a, a therapist called uh, Peter Levine who. Yep slows things down and exaggerates movements and titrates them and and kind of expands on them in terms of practical ap applicability of the type of type of work that you do if you could just give people tips uh, of saying if they, if they weren't going to go to your class or something something that most people might like a beating heart for example or breathlessness that they two common ones or kind of like restless legs or feeling a little bit antsy. What are some, some, some really practical strategies that people could take away and say, okay, I have something in my toolbox that, that can work with um, say beating heart or, or breathlessness? Um, yeah, well, first of all, there's like, I don't know what caused the breathlessness or the or the racing heart, right? So Touché. I where they're having this experience, um, the circumstances of that experience. But there are, I mean, I, I want to start explaining anatomy always to, to sort of qualify any answer. Um, but if you understand, if you, if we map the, so if we map the vagus, let's map mm. the vagus, um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's buddies and it's neural buddies, there are some, there's three major hotspots that you can uh, contact um, right now, like wherever you are, whether you're driving or whether you're listening to this in, in a chair or in a bed. Um, one of the most uh, easy and probably socially acceptable ones is right alongside um, the left side of your neck. So what I'm doing here, I'm talking to Emil, those of you who are listening, some, maybe a couple of you seeing this on YouTube, but you have the, the, the left vagus drops down and it is embedded in something known as the carotid sheath. So there's a, there's a really thin um, muscle on the front of your neck called the platysma. And just behind the platysma, we have, um, or rather lateral to the platysma, we have multiple layers of fascia. I won't... Um, get too detailed here, but um, if you just rest your palm against the left side of your neck and, and then just gradually slush it towards the back of your head, back of your neck. So I, I've got my hand really palm pressure against the side of my neck. I'm leaning forward and I'm uh, moving the skin and the, the thin fatty layer underneath the skin. I'm moving it away from my throat and I'm moving it back behind my ear, almost packing it into the, the back of my collar. So you're tractioning all the, the skin of the, the lateral neck there. Now you could do this on both sides. You could do it on the right side too. The left side is, is, um, is most available for this pressure in terms of um, the availability of the uh, vagus because the right one dives a little bit deeper. So it's not as easy to touch on the surface. So that's actually one self-manipulation you can, you can do anytime, any place. And you might already mm. do that anxiously and nervously. When you get anxious, you might, unbeknownst to you, bring your hand up to the side of your neck and squeeze. And that's just an involuntary way of your body trying to regulate itself, trying to, to um, uh, stimulate the baroreceptors in the side of your neck, which are, oh gosh, See, I say one word and it's like, okay, well, let me, which screen should I go to now to explain baroreceptors, <laughs> the control of your arteries and how uh, the blood brain barrier in the head works. Um, but oh, anyway, so much <laughs> it's, uh, because it yeah. triggers, it triggers so many different, different um, anatomical uh, experiences that you you've come across and, and you're trying to, it's a, it's a, heck of a lot of work I, I admire your tenacity to to kind of try to boil it down in terms of um uh, simplifying it. and I think you're doing a really good job from a practical point of view because because you're not just you're not just naming things and you're not you're not dry about it I think this is really good uh, that you're able to bring life to to the way that you're explaining the anatomy so uh yeah thank you keep going, keep going. is what you're saying like keep, keep going, going. Try keep it. going. <laughs> um, so anyway so that's one that's one little thing that um that you can do and i i do it 
I do it a lot. I also do it with um, a tool. I have a tool called the Gorgeous Ball, and that's an inflated um, rubber grippy okay. ball. But this is this is what I lay on my belly with now. Um, no longer a sandbag, but this we make my my company. We make very soft, um, pliable um, self massage balls. And so this is a really nice thing that you can just apply on the front of your neck. And I call this move neck anew. So I'm just taking that ball and I'm squeezing it and wringing mm. that carotid sheath and rotating my head from side to side. Again, this can just be done with the hand as well. And already I feel like, woof, I feel a state change from doing that. Um, other access points are uh, muscles of the jaw, uh, muscles lateral to the eye called the temporalis. Um, you can take your thumbs and this is, you know, this looks a little bit um, gnarly to do in front of other people, but if you clench your jaw, you can feel the muscles pop up right at a junction called the temporomandibular joint known as the TMJ. You don't want to be pushing right against the joint, but if you clench your jaw and then you, you kind of feel the hardness of the muscle and you go maybe about a quarter of an inch in front of where you felt that joint, you're actually going to dent your way into the belly of a muscle called the masseter. And just letting your thumbs or fingers rest there, even doing a, you know, anti pinch cheeks move. So I can actually squeeze the bulk of the masseter here. Um, we are doing this mm. on a, on a screen. So somebody can probably <laughs> look this up, but I'm, I'm doing chubby cheeks, um, Miller mm. here, I'm squeezing that. And then you can very slowly open and close the jaw and just let your fingers kind of ramp along the mu muscle belly. So one of the things that Dr. Poor just talks about, you can do, you know, can also just do pinch cheeks and uh, rolling skin. So one thing I'm showing Emil right now is I'm taking my fingers and I'm rolling the skin all around my face and just pinching the fine muscles that are nestled into the muscles of facial expressivity and just manipulating them gently and tugging at them and tracking them away from the face. And what this will do is it will mm. stimulate a lot of the sensory receptors within the, the fascial layers um, of the face and the muscles of the face. But one of the things that um, Porges talks about in terms of polyvagal theory is that while the vagus itself doesn't innervate the facial muscles, it does share a source nuclei with the muscles that with the facial muscle, with the trigeminal, with yeah. the uh, glossopharyngeal, um, the, with the accessory, like it's really, it's got some really cool cousins because of the origin in the brainstem. And so by massaging these muscles, of the face, you essentially get to get a, a reciprocal um, upregulation of the vagus and which is extremely relaxing um, mm. to the nervous system or to your, to your body as a whole. Um, so those are two different things. So we can go to the neck, we can go to the face. Um, there, there's so many, my book has hundreds of these and these are just, these are just stuff that's like right here, your fingertips. But of course, breathing is a major freebie that nobody needs to know that you're doing. You're not going to look weird. Like you're picking your nose, um, when you're doing a breath exercise while you're sitting in a car trying to, you know, um, deal with, you know, your kid's going nuts mm. in the back of the car and you're trying to keep it calm, but doubling down on your exhales. So if you increase the ratio of exhale to inhale, that is a vagal stimulant. And when we stimulate the vagus, we mean we're going to stimulate a relaxation response in, in this context. Um, so uh, doubling down on exhale. The other thing that's really helpful to stimulate your vagus is vocalization. So you must mm -hmm. have come across one of the videos I broke down the ohm sound into ah, ooh, mm. And you don't have to do the ohm sound. You could do any sound you want. You could do, you know, la, la, la. Any, any, any long held note mm -hmm. um, really of any frequency uh, is, is, a, is another wonderful way to, um, extend your exhalation. So that mm -hmm. checks the box of extended exhalation, stimulate the vagus, but also there are, um, the act of vocalization is also a shared, a, a shared, uh, vagus nerve brain stem originating thing. So yeah, make yeah. pleasant music come out of your mouth, whether you are, whether you think you're a good vocalist or not, 
can be extremely regulating. And it brings you back into the, the present. Anytime I do the breathing exercises without vocalization or without a vibrating touch to them. And when I say vibrating, it's kind of like that, mm, where you can mm -hmm. kind of feel the lips tickle, or you can feel that, ooh, you can feel some vibrations in your chest or in your tummy. Um, those ones seem to be more, more bring you back in the present rather than saying some, something like, okay, try to manage, just try to do some four, four seconds in, six seconds out, people's minds still go uh, when they're trying to do the, the breathing. Yeah, that's a really good point. The, the vibration is like one more object to attend to. It's one more object to observe, right? The sensation of the vibration is very compelling to us mm. as, an, as an organism. Um, and so it can distract from whatever that next thought was. Also, the sensation of the vibration, right? Filling the mask or filling the chest. I mean, vibration touches us. So we're getting other um, vibratory experiences, sensorial um, vibratory experiences mm -hmm. through different um, uh, neural pathways or different um, uh, yeah, sensory neurons that are picking up on that. And so that, that preoccupation of the brain paying attention to these sensations, um, yeah, it will busy it away from whatever wants to pop in to, to, def to deflect our attention down in the negative thought spiral that might yes. be, may be working against us. And we, we've kind of touched on anxiety, stress, and, and that sort of stuff regulating the body in that sense. Do, do you do a lot of work with pain or with chronic people who have chronic pain? Oh, yeah, that's can, my people. <laughs> all right. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, when I mentioned that I created this formula, not this formula, this format of yoga tune-up, which really brought functional movement into the yoga space. A lot of that was because people's shoulder was, were not getting better. Their shoulders were hurting um, because of their vinyasa practice, or they were told that uh, by a physical therapist or by their doctor that they should do yoga because it will help their shoulder. But their shoulder was still in pain six months later, and the, the yoga wasn't addressing what their, what their, really, what their real needs were. So um, that was part of what motivated me to stop teaching the way I was teaching and then break down movement and teach people how their body actually moved. And then whether, then they could decide whether a yoga pose or a yoga position was accessible to them or whether it was therapeutic or potentially not a great idea right now. So the more you can learn about, the more people would learn about their body, then they had the agency to be able to you know, not do certain poses because they they were body smart enough to know that they sh they might do a different type of exercise for their shoulder, or like for example, somebody has um, one wrist that extends really well and the other wrist doesn't extend very well. They had an injury as a child, and you know, doing something like a plank pose would they would have to work around it. They'd have to adjust their body around the issue in the wrist, and that was creating problems in the neck. So. Um, a lot of, I mean, for years, this is, this is, and still now, um, this is really the kind of clientele um, and classroom culture that I, that I built is so that people can still practice whether they're dealing with a long-term chronic pain or whether they have acute pain and um, using tools to modulate their relationship to pain, but also providing exercises, corrective exercises that, that really do help in the long run. So yes, pain is a, a really big part of what I enjoy dealing with. I like the really complicated people. Yeah, I, I've, I've got many clients in my mind where uh, pain, pain is chronic, even though the injury is no longer there. And mm, sure. it's, it's a really interesting one because uh, some, some of these uh, in, individuals will have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, for example, and the, the pain even just bringing up a stressful experience will trigger a pain response or people with yes. medical medical anxiety say they've had a lot okay. of health issues growing up as a child and they've been through the hospital so many times i remember doing some some body-based exercises that that triggered that triggered um 
a pain spike in certain certain parts of the body that we weren't focusing on. So let, let's do a breathing exercise and then the leg kind of goes, uh, or there's a sensation in the leg that kind of gets triggered, but then released somehow. It's kind of like, it just doesn't, it, it spikes, but it doesn't, doesn't carry on. Uh, do, how does your, your uh, platform, your format tend to, tend to, because it's such a nuanced, uh, such a nuanced area everyone's so different let's just say a common one like like um pain in the in the shoulders um like kind of up here or or sciatica pain and, and that sort of stuff what kind of what kind of workouts do you do you tend to recommend to people in, with that space um so Oh, I have so much to say about your the clients <laughs> that you're talking about and those weird transient sort of phantom pains that, you know, it's, it's really, what's really interesting is creating opportunities where there is a window of painlessness. There's so many people who are living in chronic pain. Um, you know, I certainly don't sell hope. Um, I'm very realistic about pain as somebody who has lived with chronic pain for a very, very long time. Uh, myself, I have an extreme amount of compassion for, um, uh, for, for individuals that that have long-term and chronic um, uh, challenges, but what's cool what's cool about pain is that there there can be there can be there can be parameters that are put into place that can temporarily um, lift certain uh, edges to the pain and give people a momentary vacation. Sometimes that vacation is one minute. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's 20 seconds of no pain. Sometimes it's two hours. Um, sometimes there's transient effects after a practice that show up four hours, six hours, 10 hours later, and all of a sudden there's something is gone. Wow. Uh, which is like amazing. And we have you know stories up and down the wire of, to share around that of a lot of stories in the, my role model book. Um, the role model really heavily addresses um, pain. Um, in bodies and what people have done to take control of that, you know, they've become their own role model um, and mm -hmm. learn how to manage their pain. Uh, with body by breath, I'm dealing um, with a lot more of the um, emotional and uh, trauma space uh, and helping to give people tools of self-regulation. So for example, the pain in the neck scenario. And I noticed you grab the place that, you know, most everybody grabs when they have a pain in the neck, which is, which is that upper cross syndrome style of pain, which is, you know, the, 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 the back of the neck draping into the shoulders, uh, much of this easily caused by the kind of computer behavior that we have and the cell phone mm -hmm. behavior, right. Where our heads are drifting forward and staying there for an inordinate amount of time on a day-to-day -day basis. And as your head moves forward, the fascial tissues on the back of the neck and shoulders, they're elongated, right? Because they're, they're, they're actually, they're trying to pull your head back up. So one of the mm -hmm. jobs, the muscles in the back of your neck and shoulders is to, um, is to optimize your, your, your head and neck position. I mean, really, in, in the body, in the hierarchy of the body, breathing always wins. But the other thing that always wins in the body is, um, is the body being able to orient your gaze. And mm -hmm. so you're, everything will recalibrate around being able to orient your gaze and your airway. And so um, in order to allow your head to be you know, hanging over for that inordinate amount of time, eventually what's gonna happen is the fascial tissues will start to reinforce that position. And so you'll build up more uh, stronger collagen um, fibers to allow for that length and position. But in the, me the meantime, when muscles are, this is an eccentric stretch. So, you know, if I'm, if my head is just on top of my rib cage in normal alignment, there, there's really, there's not a lot of stuff firing, but for, as my head drops forward, the upper traps, the levator scapula, um, these muscles get lengthened, but the the muscle spindles inside of them, the muscle spindles, which are registering, um, uh, registering stretch, they're saying, wait a minute, that's not right. I need to contract to get her back up on top of me. But they're just gonna, they're just gonna keep contracting as my head hangs forward. And they're gonna forget to stop contracting when I do return to normal. And then I, you get these, these bands of really tight, um, 
tighten muscles because they're contracting. They don't mm -hmm. need to be, but they are because your brain's like, oh, that chick or that guy keeps keeping me forward. So I got to keep it contracting. And then the connected tissues, the fascial tissues have adapted to that position. So I have extra um, tight connective tissue on top of uh, or, and within to help support uh, this forward head position. So what do we do with that? So first, now you know the sort of the yeah. theory of mechanism. So one thing that we have to do with that is I need to address how short I've gotten in the front of my neck and chest. Because if I've gotten long back here, then all of this is, is curled in. So what we do is we would do some self-massage that incorporates very special um, breathing patterns to help really calm down the nervous system from the heightened sense that you could hear in my voice before. Mm. Um, calm it way down to get into a deep parasympathetic state. So we massage um, in a variety of ways the, the, the thorax, so the rib cage, the anterior neck. And then we would do different types of rollouts um, in, in certain directions for the, the muscles of the back of the shoulders, as well as the neck to essentially try to shorten those muscles. So I'm gonna to try to lengthen the muscles and the fascias in the front of my body. I wanna shorten the ones in the back to mm -hmm. readdress the asymmetry or the, the, the way I've been, the way you've been wearing your body. And then after you do deep relaxation, rolling, 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 then it's time to actually reinforce the new position with strengthening. And so different exercises that would stabilize your scapula and that would stabilize um, the, the neck uh, the neck muscles and upper back muscles. So it's never just, you know, in, in the totality of programming, it's never just, oh, if it hurts, roll it out. Well, that's going to feel good for a while, but what you really want to do is initiate an, an adaptation response so that you're, you don't go into pain in the first place so that you are building robust strength that, um, can maintain that, that can handle the, the stress of that little cell phone at the end of your hand, yeah. which is actually a lot of load. I check my phone a lot, a lot of reps every day. I don't know about you. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I could, I could listen to this all day. It's uh, but I do want to respect your time. And I want to ask you, is there anything that we haven't covered something that you'd, you'd love to our audience to know uh, about yourself or about the work you do or about uh, just another exercise or just something about the body, anything, anything at all you'd like to close this with? Well, I, you know, one thing I didn't mention is, you know, the process of the process of rolling or, you know, doing these type of manipulations with your structure, um, your body is going to speak to you. It's got a lot to say. It has an incredible record of you, of your life. And what I would recommend in doing any practices like this is that you um, you set up a host a, ho a hosting of that for yourself. In the yoga space, this is called sankalpa. In the greater um, sort of uh, I think psychology psychology space or sports psychology space, we call this mindset. And so one of the things I do prior, you know, when I know I'm going to do some practices is I'll often self suggest a, a phrase like, um, I'm a safe space or all of me is welcome here or I am listening or my breath becomes me you know, I said the other one, I embody my body or my body thinks and feels. So mm. I, I, I really recommend initiating this top down, bottom up dialogue. So even though I was talking to you earlier about, you know, how my, this bottom up experience was not being heard. Um, I also didn't have the words to invite it. And so we want to invite this dialogue so that all the parts of you are welcome here. Yeah. That, that's um, that's yeah. powerful. Thank you so much for that, Jill. Uh, when will your next book be out? Body by Breath, The Science and Practice of Physical and Emotional Resilience will be out. <laughs> it's supposed to be out in February, but I have a feeling maybe pushed a little bit. Uh, we were just in a huge meeting yesterday. There's so much left to do, um, but we, we are up on... Um, 
on Amazon uh, already. Our cover is being designed right now. And um, yeah, um, I don't know. I have no idea, Emil. It's so <laughs> stressful. If you want to talk about stress? Try writing books. <laughs> uh, I've written I've written a number of books. I'm writing oh, one now, have? and it's um. But I haven't I haven't published um. So I know the process of writing a book. The publication of those books is a little bit um, uh, of an experience I have yet to to experience so we'll see how we go um, with that one but thank you thank you again and if there if our audience wants to find you somewhere uh where, yes. where's the best place to find you the best place to find me um most accessible is on instagram mm -hmm. and that handle we're changing it like literally right now it was something else we're going to change it to the jill miller t-h-e Jill Miller. Um, but we also have a brand page, Tune Up Fitness on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you follow me, I'm going to put, put pictures of my kids and my opinions. And if you follow the brand, they're the ones who do the, you know, the discounts and the giveaways and, and stuff like that. But we, we post some similar things as well. But follow them both. And then we're on Facebook as well at Tune Up Fitness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and you just the, the website, Tune Up Fitness. Um, there's, we have newsletters, we send out infrequent newsletters. We do tremendous amount of journalism, uh, writing on topics like you came across the vagus nerve. There's a huge article that we just released on the hip. Um, I'm a hip, hip replacement recipient. So we did a really comprehensive article about, um, people, uh, the, the general theme mm -hmm. of hip replacements. And uh, there's also a great article on proprioception. We didn't talk much about proprioception, but yep. we have a recent <laughs> article and all of those have free videos in them. And then we also have teachers worldwide. We do have a number of teachers down in Australia, by the way. Oh, cool. Oh, that's good. And let's not forget um, YouTube. <laughs> YouTube, yeah. And I guess the last thing is um, I do have many video products um, that are available through our website and I have mm -hmm. an online um, classes as well. But there's two recent programs that your listeners may be interested in, especially if they're interested in learning about the body. One is rolling along the anatomy trains that I did with my friend, Tom Myers, mm -hmm. who is the incredible um, uh, genius behind the anatomy trains model. And then also another program called Walking Well, a stepwise approach to everyday movement that I did with my friend Katie Bowman around the, the act of walking and breaking that down into digestible parts for people. That's that's good. We'll link them in the description and we'll go from we'll go from there. Thank you again. I look forward to getting my hands on that book when it does come out. So I'll be I'll be keeping on track uh, on Instagram and the rest of that. So but thank you so much for being generous with your time today, Jill. Uh, I look forward to speaking with you again in the future, perhaps when the book comes out. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it.